hello and thank you for joining us on this Friday, um, third week, I think of quarantine for us over here at least in my apartment. Um, my name is Sarah Escalante and I'm the festival director of the Cinetopia Film Festival. Um, hopefully, hopefully you've heard that we have moved our dates from May to our new August dates on the other side, um, August 21st through 30th, 2020. Um, so if you are not already following us on social media or our website or signed up for our email list, we've, I've included that information so that you can join and just learn about all of the great stuff coming to the festival and also just the great stuff that the Cinetopia team and the Michigan Theater team is kind of putting together as we learn about this new world of virtual art house cinema. Um, so we are trying to continue to bring art house films to you to watch along with wonderful events like this tonight to kind of let you talk with folks who are bringing great films and documentaries to us. So um, I want to say a big thank you to Magnolia who is providing 50% of the revenues for everyone who watched the film this Slay the Dragon this week either through the Cinetopia link or the Michigan Theater link. Um, we are really appreciative of that support and also for being able to share this great documentary to you that has such a powerful message about showing us that our voices, our collective voices especially, do really matter. Um, so now I'm pleased to welcome our panelist. So our moderator tonight is Zoe Clark from Michigan Radio's It's Just Politics and her co-host Rick Pluta. Welcome. Um, we also have Katie Fahey, the executive director of The People. Um, a, a main character and star of Slay the Dragon, um, and Jamie Lyons Eddy, who's the director of campaigns and programs for voters, not politicians. Very happy to have all four of you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and so again, Zoe will be moderating the talk. She has some questions, I know, um, for the panelists, and then we will open up to some audience questions. So uh, make sure to use that chat field in Zoom, and you can send them over to Sarah Escalante. Okay, now to you, Zoe. Hi, everyone. It's really wonderful to, to see faces. I saw William. I think I saw that you had a pint of something that you were drinking. So for anyone else that is cheers, we just had a cider and a glass of wine. So we're trying to do this. Oh, I love everyone's coming out with it. That is beyond awesome. Or if you're having a, you know, a, a nice cozy cup of tea, cheers, everyone. It's wonderful to get to see some faces and also see some names as well. Um, it's wonderful to get to be here with my uh, life partner and my work partner, Rick Plutus. We're not breaking quarantine. We are quarantined mm -hmm. together. And it's wonderful to see um, Katie and Jamie's faces because, of course, many like you, we've just wrapped up watching the documentary. And we have so many things and questions that I want to ask that Rick wants to ask, but also I, I want to get to hear from all of you first. Um, one note, I'm hoping we collectively can send some really good healthy thought vibes to Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha. She is, of course, um, she wasn't actually necessarily in uh, the film, but in the very beginning of the documentary, there's a lot having to do with Flint and the Flint water crisis. And uh, Dr. Mona was really the person who uh, first came to Michigan Radio and many organizations saying, uh, Flint water uh, is not safe to drink, and many people did not believe her um, until, in some cases, it was too late. And so she's just been uh, tested positive uh, for COVID-19, and so I'm hoping we can all just send really, really good thoughts her way. And anyone else that is struggling during this time, you know, sending good thoughts your way, and, and nice to be able to kind of create this community right now, if, even if it is this way. Um, so Katie, I, I think the first question, and, and you and I have, you know, done interviews before, and I think I always sort of ask the same question for you, but it, it always seems to blow my mind, and it's the one that I think everybody sort of always wants to know first, which is just why and how. You were, what, 27 at the time when this started, if I'm remembering? Like, give us the rundown. I've heard the story a million times, but I love hearing it every time. Walk us through your thought process about making this happen. Yeah, so um, I w studied sustainable business. So I was like an environmental, uh, social oriented business practice world. I was working at the Michigan Recycling Coalition at the time and, you know, somewhat freshly out of college and just 
was increasingly feeling the divisiveness in politics, but also just how out of touch the legislature was with the people of Michigan. Working in the recycling field, I remember I attempted to go talk uh, at the hearing that was to ban the ban of plastic bags in communities, like taking away local communities control to ban plastic bags bands um and and this vote gets passed there's like five thousand dollars donated from the head of meyer to the head of the committee and i just kind of was like man if democracy's for sale for only five thousand dollars like i gotta get rich because we got some things to fix and during 2016 a lot of my friends and family for the first time were starting to uh, actually pay attention to politics I like love local politics. I don't really like any other kind of politics uh, and more government. I would say the 2016 Dream Commissioner race in Kent County was like my favorite. I was watching it. Uh, and um, but my friends and family who normally they weren't even registered to vote. We never talk about politics. They were starting to for the first time. And when I started thinking and seeing who they were supporting, it was really Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. And I was like, I wonder, is there something that those two have in common? And when I really looked at the messages, the bumper stickers, the things my friends were posting, it seemed to be like that tear it down. The system is so broken that we just have to overhaul it. Political revolution, drain the swamp message. And so then after the 2016 election, though, everybody kind of who had done research, who had started to get involved, they all started becoming really vile towards each other, um, saying, you know, why did it matter that I even participated or saying my person won, so screw all of you guys. And and I was just kind of disappointed because I didn't want all of our concentration to just be on the president. Then also the Flint water crisis happening and being right out of college, I I couldn't keep going to work knowing that there was like an entire city of children poisoned and it really felt like our government was just pointing the finger at everybody else and nobody was taking accountability and i was like i've got to do something and so thinking about going to thanksgiving dinner and like being terrified of talking about who we voted for because i just didn't want to have that conversation again about how everybody was evil because of who they voted for I made this Facebook post, not thinking it would lead to anything, not thinking it would lead to amending the Constitution or put me in charge of anything, but saying, hey, I want to take on gerrymandering in Michigan. If you want to help, let me know, smiley face. And I really think I was just at a breaking point of like, I have to try and fix this so that when I wake up one day, hopefully I feel more confident that another flank can't happen here in Michigan. Yeah. And Jamie, talk a little bit about how you got involved. You were the state field director. So for those folks who aren't in campaign lingo and things like that, what does that even mean? Like, you know, talk to us about what your day job suddenly became as you were trying to get this thing on the ballot and happen. Well, we didn't know what a state field director was either. So <laughs> I, I answered Katie's Facebook post about a week after she posted it. And I didn't know Katie. It got kind of picked up and shared in groups all over the place. I don't even remember what group I saw it in. So I, I got on a conference call with Katie and some other people. And apparently Katie thought I was a Russian spy because I asked a lot of questions. <laughs> I did. I totally did. <laughs> But we just really? kind of, we didn't even meet in person for a couple of months, but I was the only person who had even like knocked a door before. Like the, I had the most political, you know, the most ex campaign experience in the group because I had this much. Um, so we didn't even know to call it the state field director. I was like the head of the canvassing committee at first, but um, so, but we just, we got a lot of advice. We got a lot of help. What I ended up doing is organizing most, I started out with this goal of getting 315,654 signatures. And so- Small goal, tiny goal, just whatever. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm a math teacher. I was a math teacher before. So it was all about the math for me. I started dividing that into pieces that we could do. Um, so we figured if we had 3000 volunteers doing 10 to 15 signatures a week, we could get that done and in the 180 days. So we just started building a structure to do that. And, you know, we got tons of advice. Katie set a really good example for um, going out and asking like everybody who had done stuff before. We were really good about that. But then we also weren't, you know, limited by that. If we, um, you know, we would try new things or do it a way that made sense to us. 
Um, and, you know, I was an engineer and a math teacher and I had to have it really structured. And um, we, had a, we had a quiz for the circulators. 3,822 people took and passed our circulator quiz. <laughs> How many questions? 10. 10. Can you share them? <laughs> Um, Rick is the beast. He's the reporter. Just, He's like, give me the data. I just dug it up for somebody who was interviewing me. So yes, I do have those now. Um, they're kind of <laughs> proprietary though, so I don't know, but it's a. <laughs> but we originally said you had to pass all ten questions, but then we relaxed it to nine down the road. <laughs> but um, it really gave people a sense of buy-in, and yeah. So I just it was my job to mostly just recruit, like give all these other people something meaningful to do, and kind of point them all in the right direction because there were yeah. so many people. There's so many people who aren't in the film who gave their entire lives to this. Yeah. Um, there's um, regional field directors, captains all over the state who did a more than full-time job for free just because they really wanted to end gerrymandering in Michigan and they believed we could do it. Yeah, so Rick, I wanna to turn to you. So, so you have a little bit in the film and we were joking before this call started that for many of us, it was our favorite line where you talk about being a veteran political reporter and you so know- Which is true. And that part is that true. true. <laughs> And you know so much, and what you know is that this thing was gonna fail. Oh, wait. <laughs> you still have trouble believing. Does it work? <laughs> um, <laughs> talk a little bit about why you said it, and I, you know, like what what is the historical knowledge that you had as covering Lansing in Michigan for thirty three years um, that made you so sure that something like this just couldn't happen? And I should note, basically, all the political pundits were like, "No way." So, I, I have notes. <laughs> um, well, I mean, okay. That um, historically in Michigan, and, and, and by the way, in other states, um, paid circulators are the standard. And in Michigan, the, the, it takes a lot to get a question on the ballot, and it takes a lot more to get a constitutional amendment on the ballot. And so when political journalists are gauging the seriousness of a um, of a ballot drive, like one of the first questions is, are you using paid circulators? And when they say no, it's like we're moving on to some serious business because this this one is done. Um, there is one exception that there is one organization that is able historically. I, I don't know if it's true today, but it it, it has been. Right to Life of Michigan um, is capable of using. Um, only volunteers to get a question on the ballot. And there are reasons for that, that all have to do with organization, that they're rooted in churches, that there's a high level of commitment, that um, their people are very, very, very well trained as to go out and ask the right questions when they're gathering signatures. And so they're really the only all volunteer campaign that does that, and so that's why as a matter of gauging seriousness in Michigan, paid circulators is really, really important. And the reasons for that, I'm going back to my notes, is because there are levels of challenges. So the first one is, if you're going to challenge something like this, is what you would really like to do, is you would just like to get the whole petition thrown out. That it you know somehow does something wrong that means that the petition itself is no longer valid and once you get that tossed then the signatures don't matter and, and, second, and just let me sorry to interrupt but katie says that at one point in the film where where i didn't write it down but katie you say that you're concerned at some point that a comma might be misplaced in the copy and, and right. that was not it, katie i mean i don't want to speak for you but that is accurate that, that things, yeah. petition drives can get tossed out for things as minute as that. And I thought it was so um, telling when you said that, because these are the things that we've actually seen ballot drives uh, uh, get called out for. So anyway, I just mm -hmm. wanted to bring that note to the phone because I thought it was so interesting that you knew that and that that could be mm -hmm. something that happened. I, well, I suspect you knew the rest of this too, is that the other level of how you challenge a, um, a petition campaign is then you challenge the circulators that, you know, primarily whether or not they're registered voters. And I see Katie going, no, uh -huh. so keep watching her face. Because the thing is, if you can challenge a petition circulator and they're not 
they're, they're, they're not legally supposed to be challenging uh, um, circulating petitions, then every petition that they've that they've circulated gets thrown out and all the signatures that go along with it. And then once you get down to the nitty gritty is if you really get down to it, and, and these can be long ponderous um, sessions of the Board of State Canvassers, which is the elections board that's referred to in the movie, is you start going after each and every signature. Have they signed twice? Are they registered voters? Is there some other reason Maybe they put their address on wrong. There's some other reason to toss them out. And this becomes a really intricate, detailed process. And actually, I want to talk to Katie about this. You must have talked about this. How granular did you get in your analysis of all these things that could go wrong? Oh, yeah, completely. And Jamie is probably the, the queen of being able to answer that. Um, so, Jamie, I'll pass it to you in a second. But right away understanding all of those details i mean it was so important to us and and i think one of the biggest benefits we had was going into it we knew that we didn't know anything so we needed to figure out everything so we took every information of this could go wrong this could go wrong this could go wrong extremely seriously and we made a plan and probably three backup plans for every single part of that so that we would be ready to assert that i would credit the amount of detail and actually the chain of communication that we had related to the signatures and the petitions, Jamie implemented a, a plan where we knew where almost every single petition was at in the field at any time. We had real time data feedback. Our captains, some of who are on this call were amazing, we actually did the data entry themselves. So they were looking at each petition. And as soon as we'd find a flaw, we could figure out what petition circulator had gathered that and give them real time feedback. And because we had an on line Facebook group and we had Jamie had I think two meetings a week while we were circulating at least with different people in the field committee like everybody we could let people know right away so I remember there was purple ink that somebody used you can't use purple ink um, we didn't put that in the quiz was not in the quiz so it it, it, it makes sense that people didn't know um, but like immediately you saw like a thousand people in Michigan being like don't sign a big purple ink get rid of it go back to those people get them to sign again and I think that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah but Jamie um, I'd, I'd love for you your thoughts too because I feel like you you designed it. <laughs> well, part of the deal too was with all volunteers, you do you have a level of accuracy. You just have a better um, historically. Um, paid circulators run about 60, 65 percent um, on their validity of the signatures, but. Um, our volunteers are like 90. Our, we were at about 90. And, wow. and wow. almost the errors were not circulator errors. They were all people signing who didn't know where they were registered. And that's, yeah. that's an amount of error you can't get rid of. But that's partly why we, we got 428,000 signatures. We got, you know, that's what we turned in. We actually got 441,000 throw some out ourselves. So we, that's why we overshot the goal because we knew that we had to have this cushion to make sure that we were, you know, bulletproof. Yeah, and you, a cushion you had, I think it was great. There was a clip from a, a fellow Capitol reporter, Kyle Malin in the film who says, these folks are everywhere. <laughs> um, you know, and, and people would comment about, you know, being on I-96 and stopping at a rest stop. And, you know, there's sort of this myth lore like, find the craziest, among the Capitol Press Corps that was, find the craziest spot that you have found, you know, someone gathering signatures. Um, and, and, and that was all, it was volunteers who came up with that too. The volunteers decided to go to these rest stops and we were like, okay. <laughs> and we talked to the MDOT cleaning people. Like we talked to the MDOT cleaning people to see which rest stops were the busiest over Thanksgiving weekend. Cause we knew snow was coming and gathering signatures in the <laughs> snow is horrible. And so we're like, okay, we're going to set up freaking folding tables at every busiest rest stop um, right before Thanksgiving. And we're going to spend our time doing that. And the cool part was, I think people, I think because we were all volunteers, people were like, why are you doing, like, why are you spending your free time standing at a rest stop on Thanksgiving to talk about democracy? I'm okay. very confused. So, I, wait, I've got to read a couple of these comments. Yeah, the comments, that's what I <laughs> So I don't know how many people are following along, but we have Jeff who says it became a competition to find the spot, <laughs> which... <laughs> Aim, Jeff, that is awesome. And then uh, from Rita, who said we were called the quote, the old ladies with um, clipboards, which 
I think um, we even heard in the documentary, and Jeff is saying, Jeff is actually Rena or Rena. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right, but either way, I want to make sure I've, I've got that right. Um, so I, I want to start getting to ask a few questions because otherwise we would just, you know, all continue to talk forever. So this one is from um, PJ Edwards, and I will give this one to either Katie or Jamie. And PJ says, he's, or, I was curious about when did the documentary crew come into the process? Uh, quote, it was really awesome to relive that entire campaign cycle. Yeah, um, uh, they came in fairly early, actually, and that was all credit to uh, Wayne State professor, Kevin Deegan Kraus. Um, he is just like so phenomenal at explaining what gerrymandering was. And just for fun, before this was even a thing, he was like going around holding gerrymandering town halls because he felt like it was important people knew about it. Um, and to his credit, when they came and talked to him, we had been trying to, or we had been working with Kevin. He immediately said, you guys have to talk to voters, not politicians. They are like dynamic and they're the real deal. Like, sure, you can interview me, but like, please, these are the people who are making it happen. Um, we had started in November of 2016. We didn't meet in person for like the first several months of organizing. It was just all online. You know, we didn't even really do video calls, which is why I thought Jamie might be a Russian spy. It's 2016. There's a lot of talk about that in the election. And I was like, this person, it has two ways to make questions. But the, <laughs> the first, yeah, you might still be. The first scene where they show us at a church is actually probably one of the first few times that we had met. First time was like in a snowstorm. And that was, I probably, that was probably right before we were starting to gather signet, uh, starting to do the town halls, Jamie, do you think? I think so, just before town halls, yeah. Probably like the end of February or mid-February. So, I mean, November to February isn't too long, and they had started following us, and the directors will both say repeatedly that they also felt like we were going to lose, but they thought that we were just so entertaining that, like, we were worth a follow for at least a little while, and they really thought that the Supreme Court case was the way to go. And I will say that a lot of friendly advice we were getting from people was, you know, isn't there a lawsuit about this? Don't worry about it. Do it later. And, and we made a different calculation. Yeah. Great. So I'm seeing more and more folks um, just sign in now for those that are welcome. Uh, I'm Zoe, this is Rick, and we've got Katie and Jamie uh, as well on Zoom. And for all of those uh, folks were uh, putting questions in, I'm asking some of my own, but feel free to type um, to Sarah so that we can uh, get some questions going as well. Um, I want to read a message from Jan Carr who says, so I'm assuming Jan that you were a uh, volunteer who said, I had never done anything like this before, but I felt totally empowered by this campaign. In my naivety with this process, I never had any doubt that our efforts would succeed. Um, so as Rick and I have both done mea culpas, uh, we might have had doubts as well. A lot of people in the state <laughs> of Michigan doubts. You were sure. No <laughs> doubt. Uh, Katie, there's this kind of emotional moment in the film where like even before you had said it was a rough day, you could kind of see that your eyes are a little puffy and you just, I don't know if you were like in bed or on a couch. It was like not the Katie that is like up and positive and man, like you're just like, I just want to give you a giant hug. Um, or maybe that's just wanting to hug anyone right now in quarantine. But like, <laughs> you were talking about this idea of feeling um, like maybe like you knew that court challenges were going to happen and you knew it was going to be hard, but like something hit you in that moment. And you sort of talked about like these sort of dark forces or like heavy handed politics. Like what, give me the background about what that moment was like and what was making that happen for you. Yeah. So as Jamie mentioned earlier, when we first started, we really knew that we had no idea what we were doing. Like I Googled, how do you end gerrymandering? Like as soon as I saw that other people thought that we were going to do this. And I was like, oh, shoot. Okay. And one of the things we did though, is we called other states that had actually failed at trying to pass things in 2016, um, Illinois, and then it was North, South Dakota, I think. 
Um, and they were awesome. They gave us all of like their information and obviously those states aren't Michigan, but even from then, um, Illinois has routinely gotten thrown out in the courts. And then when we were doing these town halls across the state, everybody um, had brought up the, the court challenges. So we knew that we were going to face those, but what the other states had said is that normally for, to get redistricting passed at the state level, the ballot initiative usually has to fail the first time, just so people know what the heck redistricting is. And a lot of people don't pay attention to redistricting until they have to vote on it. So part of our calculation was, okay, the lines are being drawn in 2021 no matter what. So of course we want to succeed, but we also know that if we don't do this, like there's no way we're going to succeed by 2021. So so in the very beginning, like we we're totally serious, but we also were trying to be very realistic and we're like, eh, sounds like nobody gets to win their first time. So we're probably going to lose, but like we have some more. Yeah. We kind wow. of, we, to be very honest, like we were being very realistic about like, we know that this is what we have to do to ultimately win. And if ultimately winning isn't 2018, that's okay, because this is so important, we need to do this. But so after we turn in the signatures, like, so like all throughout gathering signatures, <laughs> funders laughed at us, news reporters laughed at us, like the other organizations in Michigan laughed at us. Nobody took us seriously, even though I was like, this is real. We have like hundreds of people showing up in Marquette, Michigan in the middle of winter to talk about gerrymandering. There are people at the Elegant County Fair standing in line 20 deep to sign this petition. Like people are really feeling like they want change. And the court case is when I finally had that realization of like, because then after return of the signatures, everybody was like, oh my gosh, you guys did it. And you could like actually win. And I was like, wait, you guys think so? Oh my gosh, this is so cool. <laughs> Cause we think so, but it's cool to get that affirmation. And then you get the court case. And just for some context, they don't fully cover this in the movie, but of those five Republican um, Supreme Court justices, all five of them, their campaign finance director for running for office, was the wife of the person bringing the lawsuit against us. Nor the she, wife or no, of the no. bring, Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, bringing the lawsuit against us <laughs> works for the people who have to make this decision. And the Supreme Court is the final stop for this. Like if the Supreme Court threw us off the ballot, there's nowhere to appeal because it's a Michigan issue. It doesn't go to federal court or anything like that. And when it's only up to seven people, like there's just nothing else you can do. Like, like we did everything we could. We, we, we were honest, we showed up, we held a rally at the Supreme Court to show like, hey, we're real people who really just want the people of Michigan to vote on this. We, we just please give us a chance. We, we've tried to follow all of the rules, but as we've already talked about on this call, there's so many rules and we didn't know what we were doing. And we researched of course, but, but like, what if there was a comma? What if it was too many words and it fails the word count for what apparently you need for the for getting something on the ballot, which was part of the argument that the people against us were making. So, and as a leader of all these people who are investing their time and their energy and their money and their creativity to do this thing that like is impossible in some ways, I just felt so much responsibility for like, how, what do I do? Like, first of all, what do I say? That, that um, recording, I, I actually was just recording privately because I wanted to be able to go back on that moment. And, and it, we were really trying to be honest with like, what is it like to do this? The good and the bad and the ugly. And I didn't want to go and be a crying mess in front of everybody. And I just talked to our lawyer and he's like, I don't know, we have a 50-50 shot. And I was like, cool, great. I and I had never heard that up until that point. He had never told me that. And I was like, oh my God, what if everything that we have just done and the thousands of hours and all of the money, because no no big donors had come in. We had 10,000 donors of people just giving as much as they could. People were donating poster board. They were donating pens. Like it was crazy. And I just, sorry, this is a very long answer, but I just really wanted to figure out for myself, how do we act right now? So that then I could go and talk to everybody else about like, you know why it's gonna be okay? Cause like, here's the path. But in that moment, I was like, oh my gosh, what if it's not? And I'm not gonna like do that in front of everybody, but like, oh my gosh, what if it really, what if democracy, cause to me it was like, what if democracy doesn't work? Like, like what if it is true that it's like dead and that like it always commits suicide, like the movie opens and all of that. And like, I just, I'm like getting emotional again. Like I just, 
really didn't want that to be true, but it was very hard in that moment with all of the things stacking on top of each other, all of the money that they had and we didn't, all of the connections they had that we didn't. It just it just really felt like eh, it would make sense if we didn't win, <laughs> even though I feel like the law is on our side. It would make sense if we didn't win. Yeah, Jamie, we we didn't see such a moment from you in the in the film, but I'm assuming that you probably had ups and downs as well. Did you have a moment like that, you know, in the midst of all of this, whether it was, you know, the Wisconsin Supreme Court case, you know, that of course, you know, we were all kind of watching to go, what could this possibly mean for Michigan's future? Did you have a moment during during all of this where you were just sort of crestfallen or unhopeful? Well, I mean, I I had enough to worry about about the stuff I did have control over. <laughs> but I didn't spend that much time worrying about the things I didn't, like like the Supreme Court case. I mean, I just it would have been un, it would have been devastating if we'd been thrown off the ballot. Um, although I will say, I'll reiterate what Katie said. Down to the last volunteer, our volunteers were prepared to do the whole thing again if they had to. And wow. I was shocked to hear them say that. And they said, if this thing, that we'll just go do it again. Um, they kind of knew going in because there was some expectation that many states had to do this twice. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I remember having a real moment because the, 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 I was responsible for getting those signatures, you know? And I, it was just this huge, huge goal and this huge weight on me. And, and like Rick said, this doesn't, usually, this doesn't happen. Um, and the day we got 200,000 signatures, I will, I, I will always, I was sure from that moment that, that we were good. Um, it was, that was the day that I knew we could do it. I knew we were gonna get all the signatures. I knew that if, I, I honestly, even from that moment, I, I almost never doubted that we would win on the ballot either. Like I just, to me, I, that was the hurdle. Um, although I did have a few moments when I wasn't sure I could do this. <laughs> you know, there, it was just such a huge task and such, um, it was just an enormous amount of time and, and a huge burden um, and, and for lots of people. And so there were, there were a lot of moments. Um, and we a colossal had a accomplishment. Yeah, I mean, Rick, will you, yeah, will you, I mean, I think we realized that in the film, but again, for those folks that are just joining us, like as a political reporter, to see something like this actually happen, I mean, you really can't limit the amount of, um, I mean, it's not hyperbole to say it really, it was a historic thing that happened in Michigan. Oh, absolutely. I, I, um, um, unprecedented in in my experience you know, in terms of, of it being an all right. volunteer effort i mean it's i'm trying to come up with you know with, with, with a bad comparison it's a little difficult to explain like i'm not a super sports person and um if you it's a little bit like maybe trying to explain all the rules of major league baseball and how a mm -hmm. team arrives at and wins the world series right that that this was an improbable accomplishment is an understatement. There were just so many things that would go wrong. So many, there are places where it's only a little bit of hyperbole to say that I's being dotted and T's being crossed matter. That when you go into court, the difference between a semicolon and a period could make a difference. And I mean, that's, what this group accomplished on top of just the sheer physical effort of gathering enough signatures, the intellectual effort of making sure that it was organized enough that the right signatures went on the right petitions that were gathered by people who were qualified to do so, you know, where they were doing it. Like, I have a technical question. How many clipboards did the people <laughs> at the rest areas have to have? Well, we didn't. So a lot of people had this system. We had tons of clipboards. We made our own clipboards because you couldn't buy. I remember. That was, yeah. So we, we made it, our original batch was, I think, 7,000 or 5,000. And then we made a couple more thousand. And then somebody had a garage. And we had lots of clipboards mm -hmm. everywhere. But our, our, rather than most, a lot of circulators will carry many clipboards for the different counties, but ours tended to have a system with, with um, like uh, paper clips <laughs> where oh. they could flip to different. And they, they shared, Katie had this Facebook group. We still have the same Facebook group. Katie, Katie named this Facebook group 
Um, <laughs> Michiganders for nonpartisan redistricting reform, which rolls off the tongue. I was gonna say, super sexy title, Katie. Super nice sexy. done. It's um, like you heard my song. She insisted, on, she insisted on this place where people could share their ideas. And so that's what our, our circulators did that. They would show how they, they used like laminating paper to keep their um, clipboards dry in the rain. And they showed how they would use hand warmers to keep the ink running in their pens when it got cold. And they just were, they were real innovators. But one other thing, I just want to throw one thing out. I do want to um, shout out to Nancy Wang, who is um, yeah. the, now the executive director of Voters Not Politicians, sure. the, who oversaw a group of volunteers to write that language, which withstood yeah. not only that Michigan Supreme Court challenge, but now has withstood federal court challenges since. Um, and this was, this was an amendment written by the people. Um, by a group of 30 volunteers who were not all lawyers, by the way. Um, that was a huge accomplishment also. Yeah, and, and, and that, that actually town hall we did. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say those town halls that we did, we were actually gathering feedback at each of those that was used to help make decisions on what would be included in the language from day one. We took very seriously that this should be written for and by the people of Michigan. And so we weren't gonna be making the decisions just because we happened to be in the room. We wanted to know what the people of Michigan wanted. Yeah. Um, so Jamie, I wanna get back to um, some of these questions. And one of them is, uh, what is the status of the litigation and are we expecting Expecting um, either further appeals, and this question is referring to the U.S. Supreme Court, which is separate necessarily, at least right now. But you know, the the Michigan uh, case has to do with sort of who has standing um, about who is what they would say is was harmed. well is being unfairly not allowed to sit on this commission. Right, because some of your language says that someone who works or has worked in a you know political campaigns cannot sit on this commission, and so this person who says they have standing has sued. Um, talk to us, uh, give us a little bit of an update in terms of where the litigation stands right now, and I will also get to the question about just overall what is the update of the uh, the commission and taking yeah. application and things like that. So let's first start with the, the legal nature and then we'll get to where just things stand generally. So there were two lawsuits, um, basically um, trying to, to uh, they asked for a preliminary injunction to stop the work on the commission. Um, so they were consolidated and sort of handled together in the, um, in the district court, the federal district court in Michigan. Um, the preliminary injunction was de denied on, on both suits. So they're a little bit different. One of them is saying that um, politicians basically should be able to be on the commission. Um, and the other one is saying that the, the parties should get to pick the Democrats and Republicans who are on the commission. So those are slightly, they're kind of different arguments. Um, those lawsuits have, were both, as I said, they failed on their first stop. They went now to the um, Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in Cincinnati. That was, uh, those uh, arguments, oral arguments were taken on March 17th all by phone because the coronavirus stopped anybody from going there. We had originally- Yeah, Rick was actually meant to possibly go and ended up not. Us. Yeah, right, so, of course. So that was weird. So now we wait. Now we're waiting for that to um, to be ruled on. Um, the next stop, if it were appealed by either party, would be the United States Supreme Court. Um, the circuit court had to hear it. The appeals court had to hear it, but the Supreme Court does not. So um, it's possible that if the Supreme Court, if the circuit court rules in our favor, the Supreme Court could decline to hear it, which would be great. Um, we are really confident. We don't think either one of the lawsuits has merit, but we've had to put a huge amount of work and effort into defending those um, with our legal team and also um, the Campaign Legal Center out of Washington, DC, which um, Paul Smith, who's in the film that you just saw, is actually our lead counsel um, in those cases, which is, which is amazing. He's a Supreme Court rock star. So <laughs> <laughs> if it goes there, we're really happy to have him on our team. Great, and we have a question from Lisa, and this is, um, you know, sort of the second part of my double barreled question, but I want to give Lisa credit for it. So Lisa says, can we get an update on the progress with the Citizens Redistricting Commission? Will it be established in time to affect the line drawing that will happen after the current census? Yeah, absolutely. Touche, yeah. What did you say, Rick? 
<laughs> depending on when the census happened. Oh yeah, well, yeah. Um, yes, the answer is yes. That was part of the point, that was part of the reason we pushed so hard to get this done before 2020 so that this next round of redistricting and Katie, Katie knows like there were a lot of people who were kind of waiting it out and we didn't think waiting was was a good idea because we needed to have this done before the census. So um, right now we are thrilled that thousands of people have already applied to be on the commission. Um, the last number we heard from the Secretary of State was upwards of 6,000 applications were received. Um, they, they published the demographic and geographic information for about the first 3,600 of those. Um, but that is still open. That process is still open until June 1st. And then um, they will select, randomly select 13 citizens who will draw the lines in this beautiful transparent process instead of behind closed doors like all the stuff you saw in the film. Um, and then the commission will be seated at the end of this year and then start doing their public hearings at the beginning of 2021. And they can do that even before the census data is available. They can still start collecting information from people around the state um, to see what communities of interest want to be represented. Um, and we're also going to work on that. Voters Not Politicians will help that process too to make sure that people have mapping tools and can interact with the commission. Only 13 people get to be on it. Um, but everybody in the state can now participate in this process, unlike the very small group of people behind closed doors who used to do it. Yeah. Um, Katie, uh, we've got a question from um, Jan who says, this is a marvelous film. So that is a comment, not a question, I should say. Um, but she does ask, is it being used to encourage other states who are working on the redistricting issue now? I mean, I think for probably many people, um, especially those of who, who are at home and looking for things to do, that it is hard to watch this film and not feel energized and like you just want to jump into democracy. Um, so kind of talk about how this film is used uh, for next steps and what your work is, Katie, um, with possibly other groups or other states um, who are maybe also trying to enact um, this kind of change. Yeah, great question and thanks. Um, one of the things that really stuck with me throughout this whole process was the people who did help us. Um, the Brennan Center, Common Cause, Kathy Fung, who had helped pass um redistricting reform in california she helped us almost immediately it was hardly anybody actually in michigan <laughs> um, maybe the other people outside michigan didn't know better or something uh but it was really kind of lonely in the very beginning um especially because we were figuring everything out and we kept trying to ask for help and a lot of people were kind of like nope not worth it whatever and then we were building everything from scratch and it just kind of felt like it's already hard enough to get enough people to like know what gerrymandering is and that there's a solution that can end it and who want to help write constitutional language and gather signatures and pass this but also like navigating that process like figuring out how to set up like a um uh, campaign finance reporting michigan's is like a super mundane system it's complicated it's not cloud-based it's like doesn't make any sense and all of those little things that we had to learn or relearn we were constantly creating things from scratch we created like two of our own databases out of nowhere we had to like create all these guides the training series um jamie was saying education presentations and like i had mentioned a little earlier some of the campaigns that had failed in 2016 even though they were in other states they were pretty gracious with giving us at least like some of the polling data that they had and like messaging stuff and when we um when you start a campaign with a facebook post it makes a snappy headline which was like really to our benefit and there were places like the new york times that ended up covering us and we had a bunch of people who sent us messages during the campaign saying hey i didn't know i was allowed to try and do something about this i've hated gerrymandering for such a long time can you help and i was like we haven't even been successful here yet so i don't even know if you want my help but <laughs> yeah <laughs> give me a second um and so when we got done with the campaign it's it's exhausting being a campaign manager is exhausting being a spokesperson is exhausting working with fourteen thousand people is amazing but exhausting um and I, what was giving me my heart joy was thinking about, we just created so much that now we can go help and pay it forward to the other people out there who might also feel alone and might be also being told, oh, it's silly to feel like you as a regular person can try and actually do something about the dysfunction in our government. And so that's why we started The People, um, that's the name, so that we could go and help other people who are not only working on gerrymandering, but other systemic reform issues, money and politics or primaries or whatever, 
it may be just because again, it's like nobody, our civics classes don't cover how to start a ballot initiative. Like did not learn that there. I learned the three branches of government. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what's really exciting though is in, and the movie shows us at the very end, um, but during 2018, we weren't the only campaign that was working really hard to end gerrymandering. There was Missouri and Colorado, Ohio and Utah, as well as Michigan. And what's super cool is now there's just about as many states who are also working on trying to pass something. I think the unfortunate part right now is that about four of them are in the petition gathering process. Um, and that is just very hard to do when you cannot meet in public spaces. Uh, but Virginia, their legislature, um, which actually the Democrats had just recently rewon, they have off your off off your elections. Um, it, they they ended up passing something, but it's now to the voters of Virginia who can vote to have an independent commission. There's Arkansas, um, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, uh, North Dakota, uh, and Oklahoma, and Alaska, <laughs> who all now have some version of trying to get an independent citizens redistricting commission, uh, or some form of changing who's drawing the lines or how the lines are being drawn in their state. And they're trying to do that before the census, because as the movie articulates, I think pretty well, the crazy part about this is these lines are being drawn in 2021, no matter what, and they're going to impact the next decade worth of elections. So thankfully there's a lot of dragon slayers out there looking for help. And if you do know a lot about gerrymandering, um, I'm sure most of us on this live in Michigan, but a lot of those campaigns could use people who are helping reach out to other people in their state who are helping talk about education or even thinking through how do I start gathering petitions or raise money or all those things. Hmm. I want to just read a couple of comments now um, from Jumana, who says that is so amazing that volunteers were successful in accomplishing what so many well-funded campaigns failed to do. Um, also, I want to read um, from Jamie, who says, and if you everyone looks at your chat, this is to everyone, but I will also read it slowly just in case that if you want to learn more, uh, about applying to serve on Michigan's first independent citizens redistricting commission. You can go to voters, not politicians, dot com slash apply. But my guess is too, if you just go to voters, not politicians dot com, if you can't remember all of that, <laughs> that you will be able to probably, if you know how to use the internet pretty easily, you'll be able to figure out how to apply uh, from that. There was also uh, and the Secretary of State's office has yeah. a prominently displayed on there. Uh, and the Secretary of State's State. office. Absolutely. And in fact, some 250,000, a quarter of a million applications went out. Gosh, this was probably a couple more than a month ago, maybe eight weeks ago, mm -hmm. was it, Jamie, to folks? In fact, a friend of mine who really wanted to apply, her husband got the application. <laughs> He's like, I'm in. And she's like, that is not how it works, buddy. You still have to apply. <laughs> so you can read, you can read more information about that. You can also text draw the line to 555-888. Thanks to Katie for that. That also is in the um, everyone column. So you'll get to see that comment there. Um, I also want to just uh, write a comment that says uh, from someone who says being a petition circulator is, uh, this is from Judith. I want to make sure Judith gets a shout out. She says being a petition circulator is one of the things I'm most proud of in my life. I threw myself into it. And I think we really, we really saw that in the film and as we're, you know, kind of coming, wrapping up here in the hour, I want to give it, you know, let folks know that if you still want questions for Katie Fahey, or Jamie Lanzetti or Rick Pluto, feel free to still. We've got a few more minutes, so send them in. Okay. Um, but I, I, yeah, I, I just want to, yeah, Jen, yeah. you asked, I thought I'd applied to serve on the commission. How do I find out um, if my app was accepted? I mean, just shoot a text or something, because I, there are a couple of different ways that that could be. My um, guess is Jamie probably knows the answer. Jamie? Jamie will send you a confirmation, but there, um, it takes a little time, um, but you will get, you'll get an email confirmation. Okay. But it, you have to be patient. It does there, and I I would imagine that uh, the coronavirus has set them back a little bit more on that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to get a question in from Grace, um, and Grace is really getting into the political nitty gritty. I wasn't even going to ask this question, and I'm the host of a show called It's Just Politics, but I'm with you, girl, because you're asking it, and you want to know um, about the political implications of what happened uh, to Supreme Court Justice Beth Clement. Uh, this was one of the sort of most fascinating 
extra political iterations that we all watched on in Michigan, but wasn't necessarily in the documentary. So Katie, do you want to try to kind of from beginning to end give the story of, of the Supreme Court justice and, and how that kind of all went down uh, come yeah. November of 2018? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, as I was talking about a little bit earlier, and as you see in the movie, we have seven Supreme Court justices, five of them are Republican, um, and two of them had been appointed by Rick Snyder, um, and were going to be up for election for the first time. So in Michigan, like, I didn't know this, actually, even though I had probably voted on them before, but Supreme Court justices can only be nominated to be on the ballot by a political party, even though when they're listed on the ballot, it's nonpartisan. Am I not right, Rick? Not okay. Okay, um, fix it. There, there, there is one. Fix it. I'm going to start using that at home. Okay, Rick, fix it. There's, there's one wrinkle <laughs> that you're right. It's a weird system where um, justices are nominated by political parties at convention, but appear on the nonpartisan part of the ballot which has implications if you're voting a straight party ticket. There is one additional wrinkle that Supreme Court justices, incumbents, may self-nominate. So right. they don't have to be nominated at a convention. The last time that that happened was um, Charlie Levin, who is a brother to the Levin brothers um, who served in Congress, stopped being a Democrat and just self-nominated as, as an independent which I think may be where uh, Beth Clements is at. Yeah, I think oh, she yeah. might as well. Um, no, but wait, so- But no, finish the story, Katie. That but no. <laughs> yes, um, the, uh, so Justice Clement and Justice Wilder were both nominated and they were both up for election for the first time. But with being up for election for the first time, you've never, you, you are usually looking to the party to give you money to run that election. At the time, both of them were actually running together to get renominated on the Republican ticket. Um, and then we find Justice Clement, the only reason we actually figured out that that the what the campaign finance director was the wife of the person bringing the lawsuit was because Justice Clement makes this comment saying, hey, just so you know, I have this conflict, but also just so you know, I think it's fine. It's not gonna like matter. This will not impact my decision, which as the, people bringing the lawsuit, technically we could have said, no, it will impact it and tried to get her to recuse herself, except then we would have had to ask all five of them to recuse themselves and just have two Supreme Court justices voting on this. And the way justices recuse themselves is they have to all vote and I think it's a majority of the justices have to say, okay, yes, you have to recuse yourself. So the reality of getting five people to recuse themselves and, and being recused as a judge, is, it's been explained to me, it's kind of offensive because you're basically saying like, oh yeah, I can't be impartial. I'm not good enough at my job. Um, so it's not, a, it's not like a flattering thing or a good thing to happen. So we were so confused on why she brought this up because we're like, is she asking to be recused? Is she not? Like she didn't recuse herself, but like what is going on? And then this news story hit. Actually, I get called on the phone and I'm told, hey, um, did you see the story about, and it was from a reporter. And I was like, oh, okay, like probably going to talk about Supreme Court stuff. And they're like, did you see that uh, Justice, Supreme, uh, Justice Clement is getting pressured um, and by uh, political insiders at the time, but it ended up being the party in the chamber uh, to vote for, vote against your amendment. I was like, what? And so her fundraising team drops her because she's like, I'm, I, I'm not sure how I'm going to vote or whatever. And there is all of this like talk about how much pressure her and Wilder are getting that if they don't follow the party line, they are not going to get nominated. And as Rick said, that you can still go on your own, but because you're running for the first time, it's this huge, like, I don't know how to run an election. Am I going to get enough funding? Nobody's going to accept me. Get your name on the flyers. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and so um, so going into it, we were like, okay, great. So the two swing votes that we don't really know how they're going to go because they're up for election and also they're just new justices. So it's like hard to understand how they've ruled before on these types of issues are getting immense amount of pressure. So you're like going into the court case knowing that. So what ends up happening um, is at the nominating convention, which actually happened before the um, 
No, did it? No, no, no. Maybe it happened after her. They had to make the ruling right before the nominating convention. So Justice Clement ends up like being this freaking independent, beautiful human and says, I'm going to follow the law and I'm just going to keep them on because they followed the law and she should be and they should be there. Um, but at the nominating convention, which I was at, because I actually, spoiler alert, like voted in the vote <laughs> Republican primaries here, um, they, they, she got booed entirely. Like everybody was like booing and name calling and um, they ended up still nominating her. But uh, the other thing is then during the election, which I think is very cool, is Justice Clement, uh, there were two Supreme Court justices up, Justice Clement, who voted for us, ended up winning and getting the most votes across the state. And Justice Wilder, who voted against us, did not win. Um, and there was a, um, and that's very rare for a Supreme Court justice to not get renominated to. But yeah. what was kind of cool is we got to talk to her um, afterwards, uh, and she, and she said, you know, that like, you guys, the only day that the Supreme Court room was filled was the day that we had your hearing. And you guys used the petition process in line with the Constitution. That was very clear. The way we designed it was so that, or the way that it was intended was so that regular citizens could use this process. And like, there was no way, even if it meant I wasn't going to get reelected, that I wasn't going to follow the intention of our Constitution and have this process be upheld for the citizens, which I just like cried and like was like, you're amazing and whatever. But for me to, it, it shouldn't be a long leap to like feel like your Supreme Court justices can actually be impartial, but having that affirmation that like they really were meant so much and it was very, very cool to see. Hmm. I want to just um, quickly uh, write uh, from Jeff, who after hearing this conversation now says another constitutional amendment needed in Michigan exclamation mark. How ridiculous that political parties nominate, quote, nonpartisan Supreme Court justices. And then uh, another guess is in university governing boards, let's do it, Jeff. Um, so apparently, Katie and Jamie, we have a whole nother organization starting in this thread. Uh, for the ballot initiative, which actually, we, we only have about two minutes left. So I want to give both Katie and Jamie, you guys, each a minute as we finish and say sort of what are what are you looking towards next? Jamie, you are still very deep in uh, voters, not politicians. Katie, you are working, you are running the people. Um, so Jamie, start first, sort of what's on your mind as you look in Michigan uh, right now? And you've got about a minute. So it's it's interesting. I mean, we're, we're focused, voters, not politicians. Usually ballot com committees just sort of go away for one thing. So we've worked really hard to kind of stay together um, and continue as an organization, both to implement Proposal 2, but also to work on structural democracy reform going forward. And I'm just finding, I don't know, this is such a crazy time. Um, and I'm struck by how really important government is you know, um, right now, how we need our government to be functional. We need it to be really representing the people. Um, I don't think it's ever been clearer to me in my life than it is at this moment. So um, our work just feels even more important. And um, we're trying to do it all virtually now, but um, but we were kind of set up on that in that direction anyway. So um, I feel really energized and especially driven to make sure that our government's working as well as it can. Yeah. And Katie, what's your work going on right now with the people? Yeah, and Jamie, I, I completely agree. I think the one thing we kept going back to with the campaign, because everybody questioned whether you could actually be nonpartisan and fight for something like this, which we like through and through were, but it was always about this like crazy idea that our government should be working on behalf of the people it's governing. I heard it somewhere like in the Declaration of Independence or something that like, that's the, that's the goal. And I agree that during this time right now, the realities of having a government that doesn't actually think about how are we delivering results for our people every day is like very, very apparent. Um, for us, uh, we're working in a bunch of different states, Florida, Virginia, uh, New Hampshire, um, Missouri, uh, California. But I think one of the coolest things probably related to this movie is there are so many caring people in this country, um, on this call in Michigan, <laughs> everywhere, who, they know about things like gerrymandering. They 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 listen to the Zoe Clarks and Rick Plutas of the world, and they're informed. But they don't. I think it's hard for any of us to like really know. But what can I do about this information? It's not that I'm not informed. It's not that I'm not concerned. But like, 
what can I actually do? And, and am I alone? Does anybody else care about this? So what we're really focused on is like helping people have that Facebook post moment. How do you find your people? How do you find your Jamie who like, even if you think she's a Russian spy at first, like, like you have no idea who she is, but the internet magically connects you so that you can finally find all of these people who also want to do something dorky like and gerrymandering and then <laughs> how do you set those people up for success and help them feel confident and empowered in themselves of not only can you be doing this but actually you have to be doing this as the citizens of this state we have to be the ones who are making sure that these rules are set up in a way that's equal for all of us because expecting the people in office with a large conflict of interest to do that it has never worked and it's not going to start working now so that's what we're really focused on and I think I'm sure I've gone over a minute the last thing I just wanted to end with was like I think Jamie and I probably like even more me because I made the Facebook post we got a lot of like credit and we got a lot of attention but like it was very clear to us Jamie did the math like <laughs> we could not have done this with just two or three or four of us it only happened because thousands of people had that moment of like I have to do something and I'm actually going to I'm going to give my time my energy my money my creativity whatever it was but thousands of people in Michigan, even though everybody, we knew the odds were stacked against us, decided, you know what, even if this fails, my time, energy, money, creativity is worth the investment of potentially having a Michigan that works better for all voters. And I found that so inspiring. And when I have bad days, I still think about how I know people in all 83 of Michigan's counties who dedicated two years of their lives to just trying to make the world better. And like, Right now, especially, I'm really excited this movie's coming out. It's a little um, surreal in many ways, but to hopefully find those other people who can not only see how badass Michigan is, but also who can see that they aren't alone and that there are lots of other people who also want to go help make the world better. So hmm. that's what I'm up to. <laughs> well, Katie, I think that was a well-deserved uh, over one minute. <laughs> uh, but it is eight o'clock and so I want to let everyone who's on the call and needs to go go and say thank you so much it it means a lot I know for Cinetopia and the Michigan Theater um, and probably everyone who's on this call right to know that um, folks are out there even during this quarantine that as a community we can still join together and again even if we don't agree on all the issues um, that just having civil conversations is something in public radio that Rick and I believe so deeply in that we can um, have differing opinions or believe different things, but to be able to, even a community setting like this, have folks step up and just want to have that dialogue, I think right now is so important. And so I'm really grateful, even if we didn't get to everybody get to talk or ask questions, just to like go through the pages and see how many people are on this call. And I'm going to just let a little secret that the Michigan theater folks thought maybe eight or nine people would jump on this call. Um, <laughs> I have not even begun to count. And so that is really heartening <laughs> on this Friday night that um, there's definitely more eight or nine people who want to come together as a community right now. And that feels really important more than ever. So thank you, everyone. Be kind and good to your loved ones. And uh, I hope to see you all in real life at some point where we can all be together again. Yes. Thank you, Zoe. Yes, absolutely. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. See you Thank soon. You. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> I love the green who's on here who helped make the movie. She's like right there on my computer, but she like helped make this happen and like did the story and like believed in us when I'm pretty sure nobody else did. So, <laughs> nice to meet you, Grace. Grace. Really nice to and she's in New York right now, so like, also Grace, our soccer with you. Oh, Grace, stay healthy. Stay healthy. Yeah, yeah. Happy Friday, everyone. Happy Friday. Okay, we're signing off. Good. Bye, everyone. Bye. If I can figure out how to get off a of Zoom. <laughs>